and it was not brilliant. Just have a seat. Oh, boy. It's falling right down. There you go. All right, good. Good to have you. I want to read a, a verse to you, to you out of uh, the book of Matthew. Now, why are we here together today? What is today? We say it's Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus only. Now, the Lord, during his ministry with his apostles and disciples, Scripture tells us that he taught them that he was going to have to die and he would be raised up. And in, in uh, verse 21 of Matthew 16, it says, From that time on, Jesus began telling his followers that he must go to Jerusalem, where the older Jewish leaders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the law would make him suffer many things. That's bad. He told them he must be killed and then be raised from the dead on the third day. Now, the problem being this, they didn't understand it, the apostles. It was almost like this blank sheet of paper. Did you ever, somebody ever try to teach you something and it just went in one year and out the other? Did you ever have that happen? That happened to me in calculus when I was in high school. Just one year and out the other, you know. Couldn't understand it. And so this blank piece of paper is kind of like what the apostles were. They didn't understand that Jesus had to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die and be raised from death. No understanding. Just like this paper. Can you read anything on here? <laughs> no, it's blank, isn't it? Now watch this. This morning I got up really early in the morning and I went to the river of life and got a bowl of water. Do you ever hear the river of life? No. Well, you'll learn about that someday. Now, here's what happened. I also have a bottle of blood. <laughs> it's the last bottle of the big young man. <laughs> I'm going to put some of this blood in the water glass. And I'm going to show you what happened. What did Jesus do when he died on the cross? Anybody know? Beside die. Does Brother Richard know that? I can't see. He gave up all his blood. He gave up his blood for you and me so our sins could be forgiven. <clears throat> now watch what happens. Does anybody have a watch? No watches? Can anybody count to 60? Can you? Take to yourself, count to 60. Begin right now. How's that? I'm going to show you something here. All right? So the Easter Bunny comes to your house? Uh, yesterday, right? Oh, man. I'll tell you what. So at any rate, here we have these poor apostles couldn't understand what the Lord was saying. It was just like a blank piece of paper to them. Well, you're also. Let's see if you come out together. They're counting to 60. Okay. <laughs> That's a long minute, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, here's what I want to do. I want to take this blank piece of paper, just like the... I'm going to take this blank piece of paper, and I'm going to dab it a little so it doesn't drip all over everybody. Who, who's a good reader here? What's that say? Jesus is what? He's alive. Is that magic? Oh. <laughs> it's just like the apostles. The apostles had no idea that even though Jesus was going to die, that he would again be what? Alive. See? That's going to happen to all of us someday. We might die, but what's going to happen? He's going to raise us from the dead. That'll be a glorious day. So Jesus is alive. So Matthew 16, I'm going to read uh, verses 21 and 24. I believe there is a simplicity that is found in our Lord Jesus Christ and within the Scriptures. Uh, we tend to make it more difficult than it, than it actually is, but if you see things as Paul commanded us to uh, uh, rightly divide the word of truth, then it does get simple. So what I'd like to do is read verses 21 through 24. And actually what we're going to see here as we go through this is that in each of the gospel accounts, we're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in each of the gospel accounts, we find that our Lord Jesus Christ begins to teach His disciples, including the apostles among the disciples, that He must needs go to Jerusalem, suffer, die, and raise a third time. In fact, He does it four times in each of the gospel accounts. 
which I found interesting. All right, four times he, he does that. Now watch what we have here, and we're, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do to keep this simple is stay in the book of Matthew and show you the four accounts and show you how that the Lord Jesus Christ added something every time he gave them an account so that they would have the total scope of what he was going to do. Do you remember that? Okay. But yet, even after he teaches them and he raises from the dead, what did my, our text say when I read it at the beginning? They didn't understand it. Even after he was raised from the dead, they didn't understand it. So chapter 16, verse 21 through 24 is actually what I'm going to read. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go, must go. It was of necessity, in other words. Go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be what? Nice. Be raised. Now, why Jerusalem? Well, that's it's hard to hear. Okay, that's the heart of everything God was doing in the nation of Israel and the earth there, okay? Then 22. And Peter took him aside. Now watch. The Lord just told him what, what he has to do. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan. Did your mother ever call you a devil when you were growing up? <laughs> Got yourself in trouble, you know. Get thee behind me, Satan. Now watch what he says. You are hindering a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of whom? Man. 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 So the Lord rightly rebukes Peter. The Lord says, I must go. And these things must occur. And Peter says, What? Not so. These will never happen to you. And so the rebuke is just as if he's rebuking Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Because all you can see are the things of man, not the things of God. Then Jesus, in verse 24, told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him <coughs> excuse me, deny himself and take up his cross and do what? Follow me. Follow me. Now let's go through this very simply, if we can. In this passage of 21, actually 23, this is the first time now the Lord is teaching what he must do. Okay, you follow that? So it says, from that time, meaning now I'm going to begin to manifest to you what is coming. And so what the apostles here and the disciples were receiving was a direct revelation from God. Now what is a revelation? Have we ever had a revelation? No. 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 Direct revelation from God. Sometimes we do. Well, you think you do. Earthly things, yes. yeah, but not from God. So, so here the Lord Jesus Christ is going to teach them this is what's going to happen because of the cross work and the work of redemption that I'm going to complete, you see. So they were getting that direct revelation right there of the work of Yahweh. And it included, he must go to Jerusalem, number one, there. He must suffer many things, number two. Who's he going to suffer at the hands of? From the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. He's going to be killed. And on the third day, what's going to happen? Right. He's going to raise up. But, when we read verse 22, what's the idea we get? They didn't believe it. They didn't, they didn't understand it. They didn't understand it. They couldn't believe it. Alright? Could not believe it. Far be it from you. And then 23, we have this rebuke of the things of God versus the, those of man. And that's still the believer's problem today. Yes, Richard? Well, with respect to not believing... When Peter heard that, he probably, you know, they are talking about, you know, the idea of the kingdom coming, that this is the end, that if you die, yes, it'll be all over. Right. Was, yeah, I mean, you know, we have a kingdom and all stuff. And right. It keeps going on. But uh, I seem to remember that Peter warned himself. Remember the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. He was hearing what was going on. He could at least see the Lord. Yeah. What did the Lord tell Pilate about his kingdom? Uh, it's not of this earth. See, it was something grander than this earth could provide for it, you see. But that's true. Then in verse 29, or 24, we see this principle, let him take up his cross and follow me. So there's a cross principle that the Apostle Paul is going to expand on in Romans chapter 6, Philippians chapter number 2. All right, that's what we should be aware of. So that is the first 
that we hear and see of this teaching that he must go to Jerusalem and die. Now come over to chapter 17 with me, please. Chapter 17, and just two verses here, verses 22 and 23. It's the second time now the Lord is going to teach something about what, what's going on. Verse 22 says, As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly what? Distressed. Now what is added here? Well, the Son of Man. Who gave Jesus the name Son of Man? He called himself that. The Son of Man, all right, is what he, he called himself. I mean, he was connected with mankind, was he not? In his genealogy, in, 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 uh, on Mary's side, it goes all the way back to Adam. Yes, sir? On uh, Ezekiel, he's called the Son of Man, but not the Son of Man. That's right, yeah. And that's what we see. So, so about to be delivered. So, about to be delivered gives you the idea that this is going to happen pretty quickly. All right. Now remember, he's teaching them about what the future holds here. So it's going to happen very quickly. Verse 23, they're going to kill him. We've already read that. Raised from the dead. But the apostles were greatly distressed. What does it mean to be distressed? Wow. Really upset. <laughs> upset, troubled. Yeah, they weren't very comfortable at all this. You see? Not at all. So that brings us over to chapter 20. Chapter number 20. And let's pick it up in verse 17. And as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, now remember, he says, I must go to Jerusalem. Well, now he's going. He took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, now remember, this is just to the twelve. This includes Judas. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to what? Death. To death. And deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Now, so far, what is the common denominator here? That he will be uh, crucified and mocked. And okay, he's going to be raised on right? the oh. third day. He's going to be raised. So now, the difference here is that they're on their way to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man is going to be delivered by the chief priests and the scribes. And they're going to condemn him to death. Now, I don't know if you've ever read through the gospel accounts, especially the trials. Once he's taken in the garden, he goes to the high priest's place, then to Pilate, back to the high priest, back to Pilate. Where did anybody ever condemn him in those? Nowhere. They couldn't find any fault at all with him. That's why Pilate ultimately says, I find no fault in this man. You say so. So the condemnation came on their own parts, not on his part. He couldn't be condemned because he had never done anything what wrong. In verse nineteen, then it says, "And deliver him over to the Gentiles." Now, who are the Gentiles here? The Romans. These would be the Romans. Now, the Jews had no authority to put anybody to death, right? But the Romans did. The person of Pilate there, okay. To be mocked and to be flogged and crucified. So the mocked and flogged is added here in relationship to the Gentiles and the soldiers. And he will be raised again when? Third day. Third day. Come, come over to verse 28. Now watch what it says here. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Now we've heard that a lot. Our Lord's attitude. Philippians 2, other verses. And to give his life a ransom for what? Amen. By the time they get here, all right, this is just before the triumphal entry. Now, just before the triumphal entry, the Lord finally says the reason that this is going to happen is why? So I'm going to give my life a ransom for many. He's going to shed his blood so that blood can be sprinkled in the heavenly temple say, where the Father sits on His throne. And that's where it was sprinkled. And I don't know, I, I learned this years ago from Mr. MacArthur. And he used to teach this, the shedding of the blood was absolutely useless unless the blood was sprinkled. And why is that? Because the first covenant that, Mo, that God gave to Moses was dedicated with blood. It was sprinkled on the book and on the people. And the Lord did that. 
presence of his Father in the heavens when he, he ascended. To give his life a ransom for many. We're coming into Jerusalem now. The time is almost here where the Lord is going to be handed over. But something happens in between. They find a place called the upper room. So come on over to John with me. And let me share some things in relationship to John chapter 13. Four times the Lord explains to his disciples what is about to happen. They were distressed over it. They couldn't understand it. Peter says, what? Not so. They didn't want it to happen. However, when they're up in the upper room now, and there's, this is a limited <coughs> space, so they all had to have tickets to get in. So that's how we perceive it. But the Lord here washes disciples' feet and, and continues to teach them about things they're going to have to understand. Right? Now watch what happens. When it comes to the foot washing, we come down to verse 8, because the Lord here... Uh, the Lord strips himself of his clothes and, and wraps his loins with the towel, and he starts to wash their feet. Right. See? He comes to Peter, verse 8. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. You would think by this time that when the Lord says something or was going to do something, that Peter learned this is how it's going to be, and there must be a reason for it. Let me just submit to it. But Peter doesn't ever do that, does he? No, no. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And of course, Peter, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Right? So he goes overboard with it. The point being this, Peter had no understanding of what the Lord was doing at all. Now remember, the, what, what, what shadow is across the upper room here? It's a shadow of the cross. Okay, we're still in chapter 13, and verse number 19. Now watch what he says. All right. Let me start in verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am what? He. Now this is the first indication that one of them is going to do what? To betray him. We know that to be Judas. And the Lord says that to him so they can, the rest can believe that he is who he is. says he is, right? So you understand that? And believe. The Lord's trying to get these fellows to a place of belief. That's why he began to teach them in chapter 16. I have to go to Jerusalem. I have to suffer at the hands of these people. And I must die, but I will be raised. Say. So everything he's saying here is in connection with that. Uh, 26, Jesus answered, It is he whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After that, he said uh, he had taken the morsel. Satan entered him. Entered who? Judas. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. But he already taught him that it was going to happen. So it's just like going to Jerusalem and suffering and dying. They just these guys were a blank piece of paper. Is, is, is what they were. Now watch chapter 14. Here. Okay? Chapter 14. Now Thomas said to him, Lord, in verse 5, you do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father, what? Also. also. If you had known me, how long did they know him? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. But what does the Lord say? If you really don't know me. If you would have known me, you would have known my Father, what? Also. So it's no wonder that when the Lord's teaching them, they have no understanding of what's going on. Follow me so far? Yeah. Notice verses 8 and 9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Now this is proof that they didn't know who he was. Jesus answered him, Have I been with you so long? How long? Yeah. Three and a half years. And you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? No, they did not believe it. No, they were typical 
human beings. They were there for the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 and, and, and walking on the water and seeing people healed and all that kind of thing. They, they, as far as who Jesus was, they had no scope, no identity. Notice verse 11. Now watch what he says. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. What's he asking them here? He's pleading with them. Believe me. Believe who I am. <coughs> he knows he's about to leave them. To say, but he also knows he'll be back. They have no understanding. Verse number 20 says that. It says this. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. In other words, verse 19. Uh, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will also live. So he's talking about post-resurrection. Say, still no understanding. Come over to verse 26, please. Verse 26. Now watch what happens. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring you into remembrance all that I have said to you. Now there's an encouragement from our Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? Yeah. Even though I'm leaving, the Spirit is going to come. And He's going to teach you and bring to remembrance what? All the things that I taught. Okay? So that, that's good. Now let's do this. Come over to chapter 16. It's closer to the end now, right? Verse number, uh, verse 4 and 6. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asked me, where are you going? They just want to know how to get there. They didn't even know where it was. Say back in verse chapter 14 watch verse 6 but because of I said I have said these things to you sorrow has done what they still have they were distressed sorrow you have to picture that that upper room the Lord's last supper with his apostles it could have been a very pleasant thing all right could have been a very pleasant thing I come down to verse 12 where he says I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them what how come they couldn't bear the things he wants to tell them? Because they didn't believe who he was. All right, pretty simple. Then I come to verse 16. Now watch what it says here. We're doing a survey here this morning. 16, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. What's he talking about? He's going to die, resurrection. So some of the disciples said one to another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, and, because I am going to the Father. The whole point was, he'd been teaching them this, but they didn't understand it, the black, the black paper saying. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Well, at least they were honest about it, right? They were, they were honest about it. So it's 19. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into what? Joy. So when they take the Lord away, we know there's only one apostle that ended up at the cross, and who was that? John, all the rest fled. Peter went to the trial, but he went away sorrowful because he denied it. But their joy will come in a resurrection. Now, now hang in here with me. Okay, come down to verse 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome what? The world. So in the Lord's own heart and mind, he sees this has already completed, and he's already overcome the world. Y'all follow that? Their peace is going to be found where? In him. That's why they have to know him. Now, 17 is his prayer to the Father. Then he's betrayed in chapter 18. Okay. Goes to the cross in 19. Gives up the ghost. And in chapter 20, we have what? A resurrection. Now, let me just give you one, two, three, four resurrection passages here. Then I'm going to make an application. 
Come back with me to Luke, if you would. What kind of understanding did these fellows have? And by the way, there were some ladies there too. Yeah. All right? They had no understanding at all of what was going on. The reason being because they really didn't know who he was. Say, didn't know who he was. Remember, the Jewish mindset, the Messiah was going to be a deliverer from the bondage of Rome. But that wasn't God's mindset. Say, because there's been many roles in the history of mankind. All right? Yes, dear. Um, maybe this isn't appropriate, but anyway, Go ahead. I was thinking that they're like, instead of being from Jerusalem or wherever, they're from the Show Me State. <laughs> oh, yes. You know? Yeah, Missouri. Yeah. Right. We say they're from the Show Me State. Yes. So, show me and then I'll believe. Right. Okay. So, yes. He taught them several times. Yes. The look of blankness must have been on all their faces. Why didn't he just come out and say, I'm going to die and then yes. tell them all that and I'm going to be he raised did. again? He did say it. He, he, did. Did. he said, I'm going to die. He did. I'm going to suffer. Yeah. I'm going to die. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be scourged yeah. at the hands of the Gentiles. But on the third day, and then finally he told them, the reason this is going to happen is I have to give my life for a ransom for whom? <coughs> okay. And praise the Lord for that. That's a good question. Maybe. Excuse me, do you think because they loved him so much they didn't think that he would actually do this? Well, there's only one apostle. The apostle that Jesus loved is who? John. That's John. It's hard to love somebody in a intimate way, close way, if you don't know who they are. And you know what? They didn't know who he was. If you would have known who I was, you would have known who the Father is. See what I mean? So this whole thing of three and a half years is to bring them to a place where they understand, first of all, who he is. Because these are the men he's going to use to carry the message out until the Apostle Paul comes on the scene. Yeah, they all took history. They had, they had like, like the veil there. They all took Oh, the Jews did, yes. 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 From the very beginning. And the Gentiles have it now, too. Yeah. Gentile believers have it today, too. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Okay? So, that, but that's good questions. Now, in Luke, post-resurrection, notice first, uh, where did I turn? 24? Okay, Luke 24. Sorry. Post-resurrection. Now, he's, he's raised from the dead, right? And, uh... Verses 25 and 27 say this in Luke 24. And he said to them, now these are, do you know who this is about? Yeah. Who's it about? The Roman The Roman Tomatia. So there's two disciples here with our Lord. And he's walking along with them after his resurrected him. They didn't recognize him because he was in a different form. Since. Okay, but he's still human. And he said to them, O foolish ones, I want to teach a lesson here. O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. See, everything the Lord taught was found in the Old Testament. There was nothing new. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the thing concerning himself. Now watch. Let me just read on through here. So he interpreted everything to these two disciples concerning himself, but they don't know who he is still. Okay? So they drew near to the village to where they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And what happened? Yeah. Their, eyes were Their eyes were open. What did they need? Their two, they needed a sign. Yeah. And this was what the Lord did with the breaking of the bread and blessing the folks all through his ministry. And their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures? They had the scriptures open to them by the very person I was talking about. They still didn't know who he was. They needed a what? Sign. sign. The Jews always need a sign. Yeah. Okay? They always need a sign. It's strange to me when you see that. Come on down to 30. 
Oh, we already read it. He opened her eyes, okay? And, and so that's a wonderment. Now, what did they do? They went and told the apostles. This is the second group of people who went and told the apostles he's risen. Who was the first group? Mary Magdalene and the And what did the apostles think? It can't be. They didn't believe a word of it still. Okay, now watch. Uh, come on back to, uh, keep your hand here. I'm going to come back in a minute. Come back to Mark 16, please. Mark 16. And let's notice uh, verses 12 to 13. Now this has to do with the resurrection account with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and uh, Salome, because they brought spices to uh, put in the body. Okay? That sort of thing. Very early on the first day of the week. When we pick this up in verses 12 and 13, it says this. 12 and 13. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking country. Now this is what we just read about in Luke. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. So the two disciples from the road to Emmaus had lunch with the Lord. I can see them running back to tell the apostles. But the apostles didn't want they didn't believe before, they didn't believe after. Okay? What a shame that was. Notice verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves. Jesus did. As they were reclining at table. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of what? Heart. heart. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Here's the Lord himself teaching these folks. Talking to them. They didn't know who he was. Hardness of heart and unbelief. Because they had not believed those that saw him after he had risen. Say, after he had risen. Now, back to Luke 24. Now, we'll make an application here. Notice, if you would, Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be what? Fulfilled. Then open their minds to understand the scriptures. You listen. We're always looking for miracles when we shouldn't be. The greatest miracle is an open mind to the truth of what God has said. That's the greatest miracle, and that's what the Lord does here. Then with who? With the apostles. With the apostles okay. And He said to them, "Thus it is written that Christ should suffer." And on the third day, rise from what? The dead. the dead. And isn't that what he told them before he went? Yeah. Now he had to open their understanding, their, their, their minds, to understand the scriptures. Okay? So, I don't get down on these apostles, myself, when I read about their failures of unbelief and their hard-heartedness hard toward the witnesses, Mary, the ladies, and then the two from the road to Emmaus, uh, you know, that's that's a little tougher. So what were they saying to Mary? And to the... You're liars. You're liars. He's not here, see? And, and so when you read this, you get the understanding that these apostles were just men. Just like you and me. What is our problem today? We don't believe either. Who's they? A lot of See, Rose didn't put herself in that category. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I don't believe. <laughs> There's a lot we don't believe. You know what? Mainly we don't believe. <clears throat> but he dwells in us. And wants to minister through us. We'd rather have somebody else do it. See? Somebody else do it. Now let me ask you a question. If you were to turn into Paul's epistles and needed to find a chapter to teach the cross principle and everything that Christ suffered and died and was raised for. What chapter would you go to connect yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ? What chapter, which epistle would you go There's Richard's on top of it. Romans 6. If you're not very familiar with Romans 6, I'm going to tell you something. I shouldn't say I want to tell you something. I would encourage you to fall in love with Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. Because that is the heart of everything that God is doing with us. Okay? Romans 6, 7, and 8. Watch this. Come over to 1 Corinthians 15. 
Now, what's 1 Corinthians 15 about? Okay, it's, it's a general teaching of the, uh, of the resurrection. The gospel of Paul is given to us. Uh, I, uh, verse 3, For I deliver to you as a first importance which I, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with what? The Scriptures. He said that He was had to be a ransom. Right? That He was buried. That He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. That He appeared to see us in the twelve, and then it goes through 500 months less of all He was seen of me. Okay? Well, watch this when I get down to verse number 12. Now, who is Paul writing this book to? This letter? Corinthians. The Corinthians. Were they believers? Yes. Yes. Who established the church of Corinth? He did. Paul did himself in one of his trips. In fact, the Lord told him, Paul, be patient. I have much people for you in this place. Remember that? So there's a lot of folks here in Corinth. Watch what happens. We'll get to verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? What does that tell you? There are believers even today that don't believe in a resurrection from the dead. Because men are the same in every generation. Okay? So here you have these, some of these folks. Paul says, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? They can say because they don't believe there is one. And they're believers in Jesus Christ. You say, well, what's the problem with that, brother Dan? Do you see a problem? Yeah. You meet a, meet a believer who doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead? What would the problem be? Society doesn't believe in you. No, they don't believe that either. Because no. if Christ is raised their bed, nobody's coming up. Well, that means they don't believe that Christ is risen. They don't believe any of the tenets of Romans 6, 7, and 8. Wine, women, and song. I'm saved by grace. So whatever's going to happen... It's going to happen. And the only thing they can see in their short-sightedness is the grave. And they can't see past the grave. Because they don't believe they're coming up. Say, not at all. I mean, it's a sad situation. He said, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Christians live like the devil. Don't have... I mean, you know, uh, there's a... <laughs> Susan, years ago, made me a CD with about uh, 16 or 17 songs on it. You know, you have to pay for them, you download them, and, and I travel with those. And, and one of them, the name of it is, it's actually the Lord singing. I miss my time with you. You're too busy serving me. I'd rather have you with me, fellowshipping in the Word with me. That's the basis of the song. And what happened in Christianity? People serve, 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 and no relationship. Say, so no relationship. So let me. Close this up. <laughs> I have to give Susan more time back there. There's a lot, a lot of stuff going on with the kids. Go to Ephesians with me, chapter number one. The Lord had to open up the understanding of his apostles. Never, never, never in your thinking did you think that these fellows were special more than you are. Because they're called apostles. Okay? No. They were, they were men. They had to be brought along by the Lord. He brought them along very slowly. He rebuked them because of the hardness of their hearts and their unbelief. Right? But yet, what did he do? He opened the mind. See? But he did the same thing with us. When well, we got saved. okay. Let's, let's, we're in Ephesians chapter 1, right? Let's pick it up to verse 16. Where Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of what? Yeah. What did they need? The wisdom, the wisdom and revelation. They need the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of whom? Yeah. Of the Father. Okay. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance to the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great what? Right. Might. That He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. dead. You cannot 
in Paul's epistles or anywhere in Scripture, actually, get away from the resurrection of the dead. He raised Christ from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, and now Christ is able to do what for you? This is one of Paul's prayers. We worry about all the physical things with people, even unto death. Say, my sister-in-law called last night and said we don't think Bob is going to make it. So we had a nice prayer with her, and I, and I just reminded her in, in my prayer of the testimony that Bob had in his relationship with Jesus Christ. What greater thing could you have? Say, and Bob's own daughter said, God's will be done in this. He suffered enough. He doesn't have to suffer anymore. But what do we do? We hang on to all those things. But yet... Are you praying for each other as Paul does for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him so that your eyes and your hearts can be enlightened that you may know what is the hope and everything else that goes along with it? That's where the key is. Right there. See? It's not how many... You know... And let me say this. Uh, he that when his souls is wise. Where do you say that? Proverbs. The Psalms. Proverbs. 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 Yeah. In the Proverbs has nothing to do with soul winning as we perceive soul winning. Where in the New Testament tell you go soul winning when 35,000 people learn before you die? It doesn't. I could go through everything that we perceive important in the Christian life that isn't found there because it's connected with what? The earth and the flesh. God's interest is taking you and making you and molding you into what? Our Lord was. We can't win them anyway. We don't no. have that power. But what can we do? We can See, we be the messenger. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the Lord even told after the resurrection, his, his apostles, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. you out. Just take the word out. That's our only obligation, isn't it? To share with people what we are.